Good morning and welcome to our Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment teleconference, Mercury in the North, Sources of Contamination and International Actions to Protect Health and Human Rights, with Rochelle Diver and Kendra Zamzow. My name is Diana DeFazio and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be facilitating today's call. Che Alaska is a regional partnership group of the National Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Che Alaska aims to advance knowledge and effective action to address growing concerns about the links between human health and environmental factors. You can find more information at akaction.org and healthandenvironment.org. I sent a link to Kendra Zamzo's slides yesterday and a separate email with a link to, <coughs> that included Rochelle Diver's slides this morning to everyone who signed up for the call. So please take a moment to download both of those presentations so you can follow along. And after the presentations, there will be time for questions and discussion. Now it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce our first speaker. Rochelle Diver is the Environmental Health Program Coordinator for the International Indian Treaty Council, an organization of indigenous peoples from North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and the Pacific, working for the sovereignty and self-determination of indigenous peoples and the recognition and protection of indigenous rights, treaties, traditional cultures, and sacred lands. Rochelle attended the seventh yep. session of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee on Mercury in March 2016 in Jordan. Rochelle is joining us today from Brussels, Belgium, where she is part of a global indigenous delegation to meet with members of the European Union Parliament and Commission regarding strengthening ties with indigenous peoples. Welcome, Rochelle. You may go ahead and begin. Thank you, Diana. I'm so happy to be joining everyone. Hello and warm greetings to you all. Yeah. Welcome. Very happy to, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, happy to be joining from Brussels, and I'm glad that the time lined up. I'm going to be uh, talking about um, indigenous peoples and mercury impacts, um, as well as uh, the intergovernmental negotiating sessions on the Minamata um, Convention on Mercury. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on my slides. Um, that should be opened up with the introductory slide. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Um, I added a couple of slides at the last minute. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that people understood what mercury is, um, what the sources are, and what the impacts uh, are. So if you don't have uh, the first two slides, um, I'm sorry. I'll just go ahead and read them, and I'll go ahead and send an updated version to everyone after the call. What, what is mercury? There are numerous sources of mercury to be concerned with. Um, for indigenous peoples and other people who live very closely to the land, uh, we see double and triple impacts of mercury occurring um, and, and lots of buildup in our bodies. Uh, it's naturally occurring, found in rock, soil, water, air, and living things. And it's uh, especially dangerous it, since it's uh, colorless and odorless and we can't see it in the elements in the water um, and, and flying around in the air. Next slide, please. What are the impacts of mercury? Uh, we, it's a hazardous chemical. We see severe impacts on indigenous women and children in particular. Uh, mercury is linked to serious health problems, including heart disease and neurological problems. Uh, the most serious impacts are to the brain, kidneys, and nervous systems of unborn and nursing babies and young children. Umbilical cord blood has been found to contain almost twice the level of mercury uh, that that found in, in mother's blood. Um, further increasing the risk to our future generations um, and something that we definitely have to be keeping an eye on. Next slide, please. So the UN Environmental Program in 2009 adopted a decision to develop a legally binding convention or treaty on mercury. Um, this started a process called the INC, Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, uh, that began in June of 2010 and went until January of 2013. Next slide, please. So how, do, how have um, indigenous peoples been participating in this treaty? Um, so, so indigenous peoples have organized uh, around many of the UN environmental program treaties, um, namely the Stockholm Convention, the Rotterdam Convention, and now the Minamata Convention on Mercury. The indigenous peoples organize locally, uh, talking about impacts that they have in their communities, uh, sharing information with one another, 
uh, and deciding who will be attending the conventions, who has the capacity to do so, and who can carry the voices of all impacted people from around the world. Um, in preparation, there are webinars and trainings that take place, uh, just like this teleconference here, uh, allowing people from impacted communities uh, to call in to share their concerns uh, and to be able to uh, provide an opportunity to have that documentation uh, taken on site to the treaty negotiations, uh, which do take place all around the world in a different location uh, for each INC session. Uh, there are also on-site trainings. Uh, available when possible. Uh, the International Indian Treaty Council and ACAT organized together uh, to bring together the impacted voices that happen to be on site at the treaty bodies uh, and do training, capacity building, um, and making sure that the indigenous delegation is going in with a collective voice. Uh, when they get on site, they organize what's called the Global Indigenous Peoples Caucus, uh, usually representing all seven uh, regions depicted by the United Nations uh, and, and come together to have a collective voice and, and a global statement. Next slide, please. Uh, the goals of the indigenous people's delegations fell in line with one another. Uh, the top four priorities um, is a, a strong treaty, of course, uh, recognizing human rights. Uh, this seems like common sense uh, that we would be at the United Nations pushing for human rights, um, but unfortunately in the UN Environmental Program, uh, there is a huge pushback uh, by states, as they're called in the UN processes or countries, uh, against the human rights being acknowledged in the treaty. They say this is environmental and that human rights have no place. Uh, we see that in other treaty bodies as well throughout the UNEP. Uh, we were working for elimination of new sources of contamination. Uh, from mining, damming, and coal-fired power plants in particular, a uh, cleanup of legacy mines. I'll touch on that a little bit in a couple of slides. Uh, and full participation of indigenous people. Um, this was the first legally binding treaty to be negotiated after the 2007 adoption of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So it was very important to see uh, the process and the uh, level of inclusion indigenous peoples were afforded. Next slide, please. Uh, unfortunately, what we saw on site is uh, a lack of participation opportunities. Um, we're able to engage as observers. Uh, we're allowed to present interventions on the United Nations floor, uh, but only under NGO entities, not under the Global Indigenous Peoples Caucus, uh, which is allowed in, in main human rights treaty bodies. Uh, such as the CERN, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, and many more. So this is a huge discrepancy uh, that we are addressing within the UN Environmental Program. So the text of the convention was signed at, uh, after INC5, uh, which was January 19, 2013. Uh, we uh, had a lot of uh, work to be done at at that particular session, uh, we worked very hard, 10, 12, 14 hour days. Uh, the last day of, of the INC5 session, um, delegates got there around 8 a.m. in the morning, uh, and the convention wasn't adopted until uh, the next morning um, around uh, 9 a.m., I believe. So about 25 hours later, uh, we were there waiting to see the results of this treaty. Uh, what were the results? Well, we saw the term indigenous communities included rather than indigenous people. Um, and that was only in the preambular portion of the treaty. Uh, neither indigenous peoples nor communities were mentioned in the operative text at all. Um, one uh, a success uh, that's uh, definitely worth highlighting here um, is the particular vulnerabilities of the Arctic ecosystem. Indigenous communities um, in Alaska and the Arctic that were acknowledged here, uh, so that language um, is definitely something that can be utilized in the future uh, as this treaty comes into force. Next slide, please. Um, so using the term communities instead of people uh, fell under the minimum standard that was set by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Article 43 says the rights recognized herein constitute the minimum standards for survival, dignity, and well-being of the indigenous people 
uh, therefore setting um, general international law. Uh, so that was very disappointing uh, for all of us on the delegation. Uh, however, we will continue to utilize the language there uh, and push for a stronger inclusion of indigenous peoples as the conference of the parties or COP process begins. Uh, next slide. Uh, what kind of sources were we addressing at the Mercury Treaty? Um, I think it's important to note, usually after the treaty is adopted, uh, the process goes from intergovernmental negotiating session to conference of the parties. After the treaty goes into force, uh, the signatories uh, are parties of the convention, and the conference of the parties uh, provides opportunities uh, for states, uh, civil society, society, and indigenous peoples uh, to continue engaging uh, within the framework of the convention. Um, and trying to um, either strengthen or weaken articles, uh, depending on your objectives there. Uh, so it didn't stop at INC7 for some reason uh, for the Minamata Convention. It went on um, to INC6 and INC7, which I'll talk about um, in a little bit. And there is uh, still a possibility of an INC8. Um, they're negotiating uh, different pieces of the treaty. Um, regarding the timetables and um, strengthening some provisions that were left quite weak when it was adopted. Um, so the, the things that we continue to push for, um, particularly in INC7, um, were addressing sources of coal-fired power plants, um, incinerators, dental amalgams, um, the storage of this mercury, um, as well as identification of um, contaminated sites. In the United States and many other countries, coal-fired power plants are the largest source of mercury released into the environment. Uh, metallic mercury is also used in batteries and thermometers and other products. Paper milling, mining, and other industrial processes also produce mercury em emissions. Uh, next, next slide, please. I've got a couple of slides here um, showing the impacts that we see uh, across the United States uh, currently at this time. Uh, we have the legacy of the California gold rush. Uh, they used mercury to sift the gold, um, to release it from, from the earth. And uh, when all of that mercury, or when all of the gold was uh, taken out of the mines, uh, the miners and the mines uh, just left town, closed up shop, and left all of that mercury there uh, seeping into the air and the waterways. Uh, this slide shows abandoned mercury and gold mines in California. Um, this is also a huge problem still in South Dakota and Alaska, and they continue to emit mercury to this day. Uh, current gold mining processes also produce large amounts of mercury contamination. Um, next slide, please. And this slide shows the, the lakes and the reservoirs uh, that are contaminated and uh, transferring mercury to other parts of the state in California. Uh, I apologize. I know that these maps are a bit fuzzy. Uh, they were the best ones that I can find. Uh, that I could find at this time, but I am hoping to uh, find a more clear map to, to begin sharing with people, um, especially, and I'll be sending that over uh, the whisper for the Indigenous Women's um, Environmental and Reproductive Health Initiative that I'll be talking about in a little while. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, coal fire power plants, I just want to take a minute to uh, talk about my homelands and my community. Um, I am Anishinaabe. I'm from Fond du Lac Reservation in northern Minnesota. Uh, we are heavily impacted uh, by mercury contamination in the northern part of California. Uh, we have mines up there, copper and nickel mines, uh, but also uh, coal-fired power plants that emit a lot of mercury into the air. Uh, we are um, the seven tribes of Anishinaabe people in northern Minnesota, many of which are very rural, and, and the people are still living traditional lifestyles and living off the land. In Grand Portage, a Grand Portage band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Uh, the reservation is found right on the border of Canada, northern Minnesota. Uh, they have hired their own scientists to address um, uh, the levels of contamination, uh, start testing women and children, and um, see uh, how severe uh, exposure is. And uh, what we're seeing up there um, are severe levels of mercury and impacts. Um, and, and babies being born with high levels of mercury in their blood. Um, it's important that we are starting to document these things. Um, hopefully, we can begin to do that in more communities across the nation. Um, 
if you want more information about that, um, I, I'd be happy to follow up with that. Uh, next slide, please. Another uh, large source of mercury contamination um, is in dental amalgam, also something that was uh, very much addressed at the INC7 session. Uh, dental amalgam, uh, called silver filling, um, which is very misleading, um, contain up to 53% mercury. Uh, and contrary to what uh, you're told by um, specifically Indian Health Services, uh, but there are um, still some dentists out there using these dental amalgams. Um, they say that there is no vapor that comes off once they are in your mouth, and this is absolutely not true. Uh, so uh, mercury and dental amalgams is a significant source um, of the cumulative impacts of mercury, um, especially for women, um, indigenous peoples, uh, but, but for everybody that is living near sources of mercury. Um, severe Im we see severe impacts on, on women's reproductive health, of course. Um, almost all people have trace amounts of mercury in their tissue. Um, what does this mean for, for childbearing women? Uh, in 2000, the National Academy of Sciences estimated that 60,000 babies were born each year um, and were at risk for learning disabilities and other kinds of neurological damage due to this contamination. Um, and that's a, it's a, a fairly outdated statistic, uh, 16 years of continuing to emit mercury uh, and breathe it in and inhale it. I'm sure those numbers have increased. Uh, we are continuing to search uh, for updated statistics that, that can be shared and that can be used um, in, in UN processes. Uh, the Academy included that there, concluded that there are little or no margins of safety uh, for consumption of mercury by women of childbearing age. Um, and that should definitely include, include dental amalgams in the mouth of women and children, of course. Um, next slide, please. The Indigenous Women's Environmental and Reproductive Health Initiative that I referred to just a little while ago um, is a wonderful um, organization of Indigenous women uh, and supporters that was launched in 2009 by International Indian Treaty Council in partnership uh, with Alaska Community Action on Toxics um, and other um, Indigenous Peoples communities, um, NGOs, uh, community members, tribal members. Uh, this really is a conglomerate of um, advocates and impacted people um, to provide a space for a, a collective voice to, to share impacts and to uh, network with one another and uh, strategize on advocacy efforts to um, <laughs> combat uh, mercury exposure um, and policies um, that are harmful to our community. Uh, the Indigenous Women's uh, Reproductive Health Initiative um, organizes um, international Indigenous women symposiums. Uh, we run a listserv that uh, I'd be happy to to include any of you in. Um, um, my contact information will be at the end of the webinar, so feel free to shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to add you to that listserv. Um, that is a safe space uh, for us women to communicate and to strategize. Um, and it keeps all of the participants of the first and second Indigenous Women's Symposium up to date on current uh, policies and practices uh, that have been carried out by International Indian Treaty Council, the Environmental Health Program, uh, and participation in UN processes that um, have to do with impacts of mercury. Um, and that does go outside the Minamonic Convention on Mercury. Uh, we do address these issues at other internationally binding treaty bodies. Um, such as the two I mentioned earlier, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a photo from the Second International Indigenous Women's Environmental and Reproductive Health Symposium uh, that was held in April of 2012 in Chickaloon Village in Alaska. Uh, the preparation, the organization, I should say, uh, for the Third International Indigenous Women's Symposium are underway. Um, that's tentatively scheduled uh, for 2017 uh, and will be held in Nicaragua. Next slide, please. This brings me up to INC7 uh, that just occurred um, in the Dead Sea of Jordan, uh, a lovely place to have traveled uh, to participate in these negotiations. Uh, that happened on the, the 10th through the 15th of March. And um, this meeting was particularly relevant to indigenous peoples uh, because they were negotiating reporting standards 
uh, many of the powerful countries, um, including the United States, are really trying to weaken the reporting standards um, and also other elements of the treaty um, having to do with um, import-export. Uh, so it was very important that we had a presence there as these issues were negotiated um, in contact groups. Um, remediation of contaminated sites of particular interest um, to California and Alaska, um, and of course uh, many of our affiliate regions, um, and storage practices, um, and uh, this also included um, the dental amalgams. Uh, for my nation in particular, we are a part of the Indian Health Services, and uh, the waste products that come from the dental amalgams um, are most likely stored within our reservation borders. Um, so that's something that um, if you live in a nation or a community that has Indian health services, uh, these, these are questions to ask them. You do have the right to prepare an informed consent on what goes if you have a right to choose alternative uh, composite fillings instead. Uh, so if you have more questions about how you can engage uh, with your tribal community on making sure that you and your families are safe, um, once again, my contact will be uh, on the last slide here for everyone to, to write down. Uh, next slide, please. So what were our objectives in particular at INC7? Uh, I mentioned the contact groups. Uh, the plenary sessions run two times a day. States and NGOs are able to deliver three-minute interventions. Uh, however, the real negotiations take place in the contact groups uh, that happen after hours uh, and during the lunch break. Um, after 6 p.m., when the second plenary session is adjourned, uh, the contact groups um, are allotted, and uh, NGO and Indigenous Peoples delegations in particular uh, really have to uh, make sure that um, our presence is um, strong in all of the different contact groups. Uh, that's where the real negotiations take place um, and decisions are made. You can turn up the next morning and things can be completely different than when you went to bed that night. Uh, so it's very important to be at those contact groups. Sometimes they can go until 2, 3 a.m. Um, unfortunately, uh, developed countries such as the United States are able to send 20-person 20, 20 delegations uh, on site to these negotiating sessions. Um, so them to peg in, peg out, have a nap, um, have a good sleep. Uh, indigenous peoples and NGOs don't usually have that luxury. so. Uh, we really have to make sure we've got lots of coffee and, and that we're able to be present um, until the very end of that day, even if it means the wee hours of the morning until 4 a.m. Um, we, uh, at this session in particular, uh, delivered an intervention on behalf of International Indian Treaty Council and our affiliates, uh, many of whom come from impacted regions, uh, and make sure that our statement was inclusive of all of the impacted uh, people that the Treaty Council represents. Uh, we also uh, rendered strong support for the International Pops Elimination Network, IPEN, uh, who drafted a guidance on the identification, management, and remediation of mercury-contaminated sites. As I said before, um, that was uh, of particular interest um, to Indigenous peoples at this particular uh, INC session. And uh, we knew that uh, some of the powerful states uh, would be pushing back against um, the adoption of contaminated site guidance and uh, have that included um, as completed in this INC7 session, uh, which would then provide uh, funding and um, access to remedies uh, for impacted locations. Uh, so basically, um, the strongest states that were in opposition to having this um, remedied here at INC7 were the United States and the European Union. Um, they, they blocked this, uh, the inclusion of this conference room paper. And um, on site there, uh, ad wonderful advocates from IPEN uh, were able to organize. Uh, and in one plenary session, one morning pretty much, um, were able to um, hit the floor, uh, engage with um, countries, and get signed, um, 93 countries to sign on to IPEN's conference room paper. Uh, which was an official document of the INC7 session. Um, that was a huge victory uh, for, for all the advocates on the ground there. And um, unfortunately, uh, in the end, um, I, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Results. So uh, unfortunately, in the end, although 93 countries had expressed uh, official 
support on the floor for this uh, draft guidance. Uh, the EU and the United States uh, turned out to be powerful enough uh, to block it. The chair um, decided at the end of the session to uh, table this topic uh, into the conference until the conference of the parties won. Additionally, the storage guidelines were very weak. Uh, this can still be addressed at COP1 as well. Um, so uh, the COP1 is uh, tentatively scheduled uh, for the end of 2016, which I think is a long shot, most likely, I'm guessing, in early 2017. Uh, the convention has not reached enough signatures uh, to be able to go into full effect, although they expect that to happen uh, very soon, within the next six months. As soon as that process is complete, the convention will go into effect and the conference of the parties won uh, will be scheduled um, and will take place in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, we need strong indigenous participation at this COP1. Uh, we saw large numbers of indigenous peoples turn up for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the COP21 in uh, Paris just this last December that produced the Paris Agreement. Um, we need that kind of participation throughout UN environmental program processes, uh, especially the chemical conventions and the toxic conventions. Um, unfortunately, I was the only in, um, or one of two indigenous peoples there um, on the floor advocating for indigenous people's rights. Um, there were two other representatives present there um, who are representatives of uh, the Pacific state uh, that they that they reside in, so we um, we weren't able to engage them in um, in help with the intervention or participation with our intervention. Um, so we need to have a strong indigenous voice coming up at at the COP one, and I encourage all of you to um, to reach out if you have any questions. Um, but definitely, if you come from nations that are impacted from any sources of the main uh, mercury contamination um, mercury contamination sites, um, impacts, please um, please reach out and, uh, and consider participating in this really important process. Um, as indigenous communities, uh, as stated in, in this um, convention, um, that just shows the importance of, of being present. Um, I believe that if there weren't an indigenous delegation there at IMC5, um, indigenous communities wouldn't even have made it into the preamble. We might have been left out altogether. Uh, further proving that um, that our our voices um, need to be heard there, and we need to be present to continue um, to our our rights under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, but more importantly, our, our basic human rights that we all have um, that are inherent to all of us. Um, next slide is Chimi Gwich, who's many things in, in my Ojibwe language. Um, and next slide, please. And this is the contact information. Uh, for me um, at the International Indian Treaty Council. Uh, the main office is located in San Francisco, California. Uh, we are always happy to have visitors come by. Uh, if you are in, in the neighborhood or happen to be in the city, and this is our uh, mission statement here. Uh, please check out our website. That will give you a lot more information on the Mercury Treaty uh, participation um, in other UN environmental program uh, processes. Um, the activities of the Environmental Health Program, um, and then, of course, outlying um, all four of um, our program areas um, covered. So with that, um, I will say thanks once again. I'm very happy to have joined you, um, and we can go to the next to the next section. Thank you. All right. Th thank you so much, Rochelle. I know it's been a long day and probably a long week for you, so we appreciate you joining um, us all the way from Brussels. And if you could just stay on the line um, so that we can field some questions at the end of the call, that would be great. Um, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Kendra Zamzow. Kendra is an environmental geochemist and is the Alaska representative for the Center for Science and Public Participation, an organization that provides training and technical advice to grassroots groups on water pollution and natural resource issues, especially those related to mining. She has a PhD in environmental chemistry from the University of Nevada, Reno, and a BA in molecular and cellular biology from Humboldt State University, California. Dr. Zamzow has five years experience as a contract fisheries biologist with Alaska Department of Fish and Game, 
the Forest Service, and the National Marine Fisheries Service, and was the field coordinator for marine mammal biologists in False Pass and Prince William Sound, Alaska, for two years. Welcome, Kendra. You may go ahead and begin. Yeah, good morning. Um, uh, that's kind of a, a daunting introduction. Uh, <laughs> being called doctor is still uh, new to me, I think. Um, so I'll, I'll try and go through some of this um, fairly quickly because I want to save time for questions, but that is going to be hard. Uh, let's go to slide two. And what, this is kind of the answer um, to the presentation is, is understanding um, not only what the sources are, but how they get to you and, and whether those sources are important for you um, in toxicity or not. And I have this little flag here that says SRB bacteria. Um, we'll talk a lot about that because if, if, if the root of mercury getting to you is through food, it has to go through these bacteria first. And so that's uh, something really important I want you to understand and, and I think we'll, um, I think you'll have a good grasp of that by the, the end of this if, if you're not already familiar with that. Let's go to slide three. Um, sources. There's a lot of natural sources that we can't do anything about. You know, if there's a wildfire or a volcano, they will deposit mercury uh, in the area, and, and there isn't anything we can really do about that. Um, but there is something, as Rochelle mentioned, that we can do about coal plants, incinerators, and gold mines. And I, I wanted to mention that in Alaska, we have a lot of gold mines, but we currently have no gold mines that have a mercury issue. Um, the, the proposed Donlin mine will be the first one, and they will actually have quite a large mercury issue. Uh, but it's a very different situation than in um, California in the 1800s, where they actually mined mercury in the coast, <coughs> took it to the Sierras, and then actually poured liquid mercury down the slopes of mountains to get the gold out. And that is, uh, that is still quite an issue um, in California, throughout California. Um, so let's go to slide four. Um, these, these are some of the roots of how mercury gets to Alaska and the West Coast. You see that big red curly Q, and that's showing um, high concentrations of mercury coming from Asia and China. And that's one of our primary sources. We actually don't release a lot of mercury in the state of Alaska itself. Uh, it's calculated at something like 70 pounds a year <clears throat> that Alaska itself releases, which is really pretty small. But it, it does come across as a gas on these atmospheric currents, and it can also come across on, <clears throat> on ocean currents. Um, and then I mentioned migration there. A very minor source is that animals can pick up mercury in one place, like the ocean or, or a mercury source somewhere, and bring it somewhere else. So I just wanted that concept to be out there, but it, it is a pretty minor source. So let's go to slide five. Um, this is where I get into some chemistry, and I, I, I hope I'm making it fairly painless. We'll go through what I hope is a fairly painless slide. Um, HG is the symbol for mercury, and there's a little, a little zero at the end there, and, and I think of that as like a little happy face. It's, it's very happy and stable where it is. It likes to float around in the currents that circle around the Earth, and especially around the north, um, partly because that's, that's where most of the sources are. Most of your incinerators, coal fire power plants, industry, um, a lot of that is already in the north. Um, so it'll stay up there for years uh, and, and not have any interest in coming back to Earth. Let's go to slide six. So if it stays up there, what's it, what's it doing in us? Um, so let's go to slide seven. Uh, it's not the only kind of mercury. In, um, and here I'm still talking about a mercury in the atmosphere, a gas. I'm not talking about the kind of mercury that, that was used, um, poured down mountain slopes. Um, there's something called ionic mercury. And it doesn't have that little happy face. It's got a two plus at the end. And what that means is it's got two arms and it wants to grab something or it doesn't feel complete. So once it grabs onto something, then it feels very stable and it's, it's likely to be stable in water, or um, it actually can even form solids, like solid rock. So I wanted to introduce that concept to you, and, and we'll go through that a little bit more. Um, let's go to slide eight. So 
I like to think of this, this Mercury 2 Plus with the two arms out, I, I like to think of that as kind of like a toddler. It is a gas, it's in the air, um, and it's really reactive. Um, it, it, it really needs hands to hold. So let's go to slide nine. This is originally an animation I had to split up, make it a PDF. So um, if, if toddler Mercury is able to put a hand out and, and two aunties grab those hands, it's really happy. So here I'm, I'm using these molecules, these hydroxy molecules, as aunties. Um, it's perfectly happy and will walk along just fine as long as an ante has each hand. And then if you go to slide 10, um, better yet, if it can use both hands to wrap around sulfide, I'm calling this Mama S. It, it just loves sulfide. And if it can get its hands wrapped around it, it doesn't want to let go. Um, so these are, these are really important kind of concepts to know because none of these, those two forms are not toxic. So if you go to slide 11, you see um, toddler mercury, toddler mercury holding on to auntie, holding on to mama, and then this methyl mercury. That's the toxic form. And the only way it can become, um, I should say that's a toxic form if you're, in, if you're eating food. There are toxic forms if you simply um, uh, inhale it. That's, that's toxic all by itself. Um, but if you're eating, if you're exposed through food, it's got to have this methyl group on it. And the only way it can get that methyl group is if a bacteria slaps it on, it's particularly these SRB bacteria. So that's really important to know because these bacteria don't live in the air. And there's a lot of places that they, they don't live. So let's go to slide 12 we were looking at where they do live. Um, they love these wetland, marshy, estuary type areas. Think of just about any area where you're um, mucking around and you smell hydrogen sulfide. If you're in uh, coastal muck or something like that, that's, these bacteria are producing that, that rotten egg smell. Um, and, and so that's the kind of place where you'll find them. You won't find them on dry tundra, mountaintops, running streams with a lot of oxygen, even in lakes that have a lot of oxygen. There's a lot of places where they're simply not going to live. So, you're, so mercury that lands in those areas, if it deposits out of the atmosphere in some of those dry areas, it's not going to methylate and it's not going to get into the food chain. Um, so slide 13 kind of summarizes that. You can't complete that pathway from a source to you through food. Um, unless those bacteria are involved. Once those bacteria are involved, they slap a methyl group on there. And the reason they're doing it is because they need the mercury out of their cell. It's the way that they get it out of their own cells. But in, do in doing that, they've now made it so it can get into our cells. Um, and then there's something that's really important to know also is that um, once it's methylated, it can be demethylated. And that's usually through sunlight. So it's an interactive process that can be very complicated. And sometimes, really, all, the only way you can know what's going on is to measure it. Let's go to slide 14. What I want you to notice here is these the big orange dots are almost all in the dark green areas. And this is a USGS study that looked at mercury in pike in Alaska. And they looked at it in relation to um, elevation, length, weight, um, mercury mines. Uh, and, and for the most part, the biggest correlation was wetlands. Um, I want you to look at that little, that area of little red dots clustered around the Kuskokwim, kind of like chicken pox or something there. That's an area of natural rock that's known, of rock that's known to be naturally high in mercury. And there, I think there's two reasons you don't see big orange dots next to that chicken box area. One is that um, you don't see extensive wetlands right there, but the other is that they, they haven't done studies there. Um, there are some studies that have been done, but the results are still coming out. So it'll be interesting to, to get those and put it on this map and see and see how well they correlate. But, uh, but wetlands are a really big factor. Let's go to slide 15. So that, that chicken pox area that I showed you is what, what's called the Kuskokwim mercury belt. Um, mercury doesn't all only come from the atmosphere. It also comes from the interior of the Earth, 
uh, comes up during these um, geologic processes like volcanic activity. And when it comes up from the interior of the Earth, it's really, it's not like Mercury holding on to Mama. It's Mercury holding on to Mama and a big group hug. So you've got gold that's hugging on to Mama sulfide and arsenic and all kinds of things love Mama sulfide. And they all come up together. And then they all solidify together. So that's, that's an issue for a couple of reasons. Um, so let's go to slide 16. If you're a gold mining company and all you want is the gold and you don't want the arsenic or the mercury or the sulfide or the cadmium or anything else that's in there, um, somehow you have to break that group hug up. You've got to split all those bonds. And the way that they do that is they, they put the ground up ore into a, a big tube called an autoclave and apply a, a lot of heat and a lot of pressure and that causes the mercury to vaporize back into the atmosphere. Um, and then other things are happening to the other elements, but, but for mercury it goes back in the atmosphere. So slide 17, um, even though it goes into the atmosphere, the, the people that are supposed to run the Donlin mine will be capturing over 99% of that um, and capturing it, condensing it into a liquid form and putting it in uh, storage containers to then ship out of the region to some unknown storage site. There actually is no storage site available at the moment. I guess they'll cross that bridge when they get there. Um, so we're going to end up with mercury in a couple of different places. One is the store liquid storage containers. Um, one is in the atmosphere. There won't be a lot, and it's expected to be the kind that goes into the global pool and circles around the happy kind that circles around the Earth. On the other hand, if we don't measure, we don't know that. We don't know how much is that reactive mercury versus the happy mercury. So we don't know how much might come out near, near, you know, in Alaska somewhere, um, as opposed to floating around and coming out in Portugal or Kazakhstan or somewhere. Um, and then we'll also get some that never enters this pressure tube and ends up in the tailings. Um, so there's a couple different areas it could go. Let's go to slide 18. Um, these are the kinds of toxic effects you can see. And uh, I think I'll just move on because um, Rochelle talked about a lot of those. Uh, except to say that, that um, the route of mercury getting to you through food is different than the route through inhalation, where that is a direct, immediate toxic effect if you inhale mercury, uh, gaseous mercury. Um, I think I'm going to skip this uh, slide 19 in the interest of time. It just shows um, that basically mercury, you have sulfides on your cells that are really important, and, and they have a process, like a factory process that they're busy coordinating, and when mercury is around, it blocks that process. So let's go through slides 19, 20 uh, to 21. Again, because I'm, I'm hoping we have some time for questions here. Um, so in the in the Donlin area, they have measured um, the mercury that's in vegetation before any mining has occurred. Uh, they measured it in lichens, berries, spruce, willow, and alder. And you would think because it's the rock that's high in mercury that the plants would be, but they aren't. So that's good to know. They're not taking it up. The highest mercury was in lichen, but the concentrations they found in lichen in the Donlin area were the same as they found anywhere else in Alaska, which means that they're basically, the lichen are pulling the mercury out of the air, not out of the soil. Um, and not at the Donlin area, but in other parts of Alaska, they also looked at the relationship between mercury and lichen and mercury and reindeer and found that mercury would not be passed from less than two rings. So um, let's go to slide 22. So well, why is that? Um, basically, the lichen and, and even the water, um, even near old mercury mines, was fairly low. Uh, secondly, mercury in air doesn't have a methyl group on it. It doesn't have bacteria in the air that can do that. And then the, the other really important reason is that it's a one-step food chain. Mercury comes out of the air. You know, the lichen takes it out of the air. The reindeer takes it out of the lichen. That's one step, maybe two steps, if you consider the air to the plant as a step. 
So it's a very short food chain. If we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about the food chain. Um, slide 23, uh, the, 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 the path from water to fish to us is, is a much more uh, dangerous and potentially toxic pathway. Even though water is very low in mercury in the Kuskokwim area, the fish were relatively high. Um, so depending on whether you use the FDA definition of high mercury or the EPA definition of high mercury, it's, it's in between. So it's potentially unsafe. Um, and this is mostly with pike. And, and that's, it's important, I, I don't go into the different kinds of fish, but it's mostly pike <clears throat> that tend to be the issue. So slide 24 talks about the food chain. Um, you see there's lots of little pictures there. And what this is, is this is all the kinds of steps you can have in an aquatic food chain. And mercury concentrates with each of those steps as you go up the food chain. So instead of going from lichen to reindeer, you're going from, well, first off, you've got water, so you have the potential to have these bacteria around. These bacteria have to be in a watery environment. Um, they can go from, from plants or little egg, fish eggs into stream insects, into juvenile, you know, tiny, tiny fish that are just developing into juvenile fish, into pike. Each of those is a step, and it goes up and up and up and up, and you have a chance to concentrate all the way up the food chain there. So slide 25, we're almost to the end here. Um, so are we doomed, you know, if we eat these fish? Um, first off, um, not all fishy areas are places that mercury will methylate. Like I said, those, those very bubbly running mountain streams um, and a lot of lakes are areas that you won't find this kind of methylation. Um, sometimes there's methylation going on in the lake, but it's being demethylated by the sun almost as fast. So again, it can be very complicated to understand exactly what the concentrations are. Um, and then there's another thing is that, that all of us actually get rid of mercury to some degree. Uh, it's about, so if you take in one fish that has mercury in it and you don't eat any fish again for three months, which is obviously not realistic for most of us, um, you will get rid of about half of that mercury. And animals do the same thing. So it's really a matter of how much is taken in versus how much you eliminate. And, and there's also a lot of fish that have very low mercury, such as salmon um, and, and small fish. So those are things that, that you need to do some research on. There's lots of information out there on, on what fish are, tend to be safe. A lot of fish is, of course, very, very good for you to eat. Um, Okay, so I think this is this is the second to the last slide. Um, so is everything fine? Not really, not necessarily. Um, if you have an industry source or if you have a legacy source like those old mercury mines, um, then you need to you need to monitor. You need to know what's going on. It's it's such a complicated process. The way mercury cycles from air to water to soil, um, in and out of bacteria and so forth that measuring is the best way to know what's going on. You need, if you have an industry source, measure it in the emission stacks. So you know what type of mercury is leaving the stack. Measure it in the air. Um, at Donlin, there'll be mercury that comes, um, vaporizes off the tailings pond into the air. Might be a small source, but we don't know if we don't measure it. Um, measure the dust and, and all of that. And then, importantly, in processing areas where you have these these processes that are turning mercury from the rock into a vapor, I think it's really important to have some kind of a monitoring device so you know that there's no leakage and people aren't being exposed. And then fish tissue, human hair, that's your kind of gold standard. You really know whether something is in your fish or in yourself um, if you get that testing done. And the last slide, oh, second to last slide. Um, Rochelle mentioned storage, and that's super important. I, the biggest risk that I see at, at the Donlin mine or any similar mine that's developed that, that needs to capture and move mercury is, is, is actually moving it down a river. That, that just really concerns me. Um, 
So I, storing it, packaging it, uh, what I'm showing in this slide is uh, the, the Department of Energy stores and packages because they're in charge of taking all the mercury byproduct from the military all over the U.S. and moving it to a site in Nevada. So they've really paid a lot of attention to how they want to do this safely. And uh, last slide, slide 28, just a summary. Um, there's global sources, there's local sources, um, there's pathways that are either food or direct inhalation are the two most common. Um, understand what receptors are um, concentrating mercury and which ones are not, and then monitor. Uh, that's, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Kendra. Um, I know you were a little pressed for time there, so thanks for leaving some time for questions here at the end. Uh, we got started a little bit late, but I think we can take a few. So we'd like to invite questions and comments from our participants now. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star two to unmute your line. Please also state your name and affiliation, and we ask that you do try to be brief so we can get to a few questions. Um, I have a question, please. Okay, C can you let us know who you are? Yeah, um, my name is Judy Reese, and I'm with the uh, Division of Forestry, and I'm a stewardship forester. And a question for Kendra. Um, in meeting with a fish broker in Homer several months ago, um, he mentioned to me that the, um, the commercial catch and the, some of the recreational catch um, off the coast of Alaska is so murked out, he said, that it's unfit for export to many countries that have um, higher standards uh, relative to human health than we have in America. And so they all come back to Alaska and the United States to be sold. Um, do you have any information on this? And is that something of concern or monitoring as well? Uh, yeah, I, I I don't have specific information, but I do know that a lot of our large halibut and our large rockfish um, do have high concentrations of mercury. Our, all the salmon that have been tested have been have been very low. Uh, so it depends on the species, and and that it's really kind of the very large, long-lived top predators that we've seen have the high mercury. Um, and I I think. The Department of Health and Human Services, I think, has the fish advisories um, posted on their website of which ones are uh, the highest in mercury. But I don't know what the cutoff is for export. OK, thank you. Thank you. Again, if you'd like to ask a question of either Rochelle or Kendra, please press star 2 to unmute your line. And when you're done asking, if you could press star 2 to mute your line again, that will help with background noise. Well, I have a question for Rochelle. This is Fran Solomon from the Evergreen State College in Tacoma, Washington. One of your early slides uh, had the abbreviation FPIC. And you know, would you just share what that stands for? Well, absolutely. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I apologize that I wasn't able to go into too much detail on everything. Um, so uh, FPIC is a free prior and informed consent. Um, uh -huh. That is a right list. Yeah, it's a right listed under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it's also acknowledged in uh, other legally binding uh, UN treaty bodies. Um, but everybody has that right to uh, things that are happening on their land. Um, and um, if if a mining company is coming in, say, uh, they will um, have some kind of engagement process um, that they will. Uh, you know, try to use as a free prior and informed consent. Um, sometimes they see it as a free prior and informed consultation, um, and and communities aren't aren't able to say no, or what happens if they do say no. Um, but yes, that's the the background on that term. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have time for for one more if we go over just a little bit, and then I have some announcements. Again, star two to unmute your line if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. Mm -hmm. 
Well, then I just want to thank both of our presenters again for their time in, in preparing and presenting today, and all of you who called in. Please do look for a follow-up email from me with a link to the recording and also any additional um, resources and links that our presenters will provide me, I will make sure to include in that follow-up. I do want to announce a couple of special events coming up. Let's see, we have on Tuesday, June 28th in Anchorage, Alaska Community Action on Toxics will be hosting a talk with Arlene Bloom. Arlene is a biophysical chemist, author, and mountaineer. Her talk, Breaking Trail, Molecules and Mountains, Peaks, Public Health, and Science, will take place at Alaska Public Media Studio next to the Alaska Pacific University campus in Anchorage. She will discuss her science and policy work to prevent chemicals in everyday products, as well as her adventures climbing some of the world's most challenging peaks. There will be a reception at 6.30 p.m. and the program begins at 7 p.m. And again, that's on Tuesday, June 28th in Anchorage. Um, you'll also want to mark your calendars for an event that we're convening this fall. We'll be holding a Children's Environmental Health Summit on October 5th and 6th at Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage. The summit will address environmental health and health disparities of children at the top of the world and ways that we can work together to ensure healthy homes, child care facilities, schools and communities. And again, that's in early October on the 5th and 6th. And finally, um, if you found today's presentations and discussion valuable, please consider making a donation in support of our monthly CHE Alaska teleconferences. Your gift will provide the support we need to continue bringing these calls to you. And to make a contribution, you can go to akaction.org and click on the Donate button. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate your time, and we look forward to having you on the line again in a future call. So. Look for announcements about those upcoming topics, and please attend our events if you're in Anchorage. Thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful day.